Welcome back to the program. It was an impossible choice, the cruelest dilemma. Escape and save your own life only to endanger the lives of those left behind. Some hostages knew they would stay till the very end. Others were desperately searching for any chance to get out. Three of the hostages have now escaped. But their freedom has come at a high price for the 15 left behind with the gunman. He wants to make a deal. So he says, all right, if anyone else runs, I'm going to kill someone. Deal? And so everyone's like, yes, deal. And he goes, this is, he goes, this isn't just for me though, because if you run, you're the one that's gonna get blamed and sent to jail because you killed someone. He wants all of you to take responsibility for the next person who runs because there will be a death. Yes. If someone else leaves, someone dies. It's an eye for an eye. And yeah, so it, it, the stakes just got a lot higher after those first three left. The gunman and his hostages are now bunched up in the corner of the building facing Martin Place. It makes things much more difficult for the police and in particular for the sniper perched in the Channel 7 building. I'm wondering whether you're thinking, take the shot. You shoot already, right? Um, from my understanding, um, the glass may have, been, may have been too thick or something, so if he had taken the shot, maybe the bullet would have deviated and hit someone else or, you know. And he had these human shields. Yeah, absolutely. So that would have made the sniper's job more difficult. The gunman believes that at any moment police will launch an assault. He jumps at every sound, even the ice machine in the kitchen. The ice machine went on you know, every hour since we were in there, 16, 17 hours. Hmm. And you know, every time he'd think, oh, police are coming after me, someone has to die. The police are inching closer but it's Fiona the gunman sends to investigate. We did hear a noise, so I knew they were there. And they did make like a small noise and um, the gunman was very paranoid, so he always got me to go, you know, check noise in the kitchen or upstairs. Um, Which is extraordinary hmm. because if there were hmm. police there, hmm. was he trusting you'd come back and say, yes, <laughs> I guess so. there's a problem? I guess so. <laughs> He um, spotted, I think, a policeman outside at the very last window. And he got, I think it was Jared, to write down on a piece of paper, go away or he will kill us. And he told me to go up to the window and just hold it there for uh, two minutes. So I just went and held it there. And outside I could hear the policeman say, this guy is crazy. And they, they left immediately because, you know, they didn't want anything to happen. Um, so they saw the sign? They saw the sign, yeah. By now, police believe they know the identity of the gunman, though it will be some hours before they release it. He is man Haran Monas, an Iranian-born, self-proclaimed Muslim cleric. The police know him well. He has already mounted a hate mail campaign against the families of Australian soldiers killed in Afghanistan and is on bail on charges of being an accessory to the stabbing murder of his ex-wife. It was very strange. He would have a big smile on his face when he would threaten us. I don't know why he keeps smiling, but I would remember those teeth. Did he threaten you with the gun? Yes. I noticed that one of our hostages, my co-workers, hasn't eaten anything. And I just hand signaled for him to have a sandwich because it was on a table behind me. Um, and the gunman took that as him and I trying to plan our escape. And that's when he pointed the gun to my face and said to be careful that he could misunderstood what I'm saying or doing. And he would, he would, have, he would have shot me. That's a horrifying moment. Yes. The gunman's behaviour is erratic. 
In between repeated threats to kill the hostages, Monas allows both Jared and Fiona to give them food and water from the kitchen. I said, I don't even like saying the name anymore, but it's what I had to call him. I said, brother, I said, I'm hungry. Can I please get something to eat? I said, yes, Fiona, get Selena something to eat and anyone else who wants it and get me some tea. <laughs> Up Fiona got such a courageous girl. She went in. Jared said, can I help Fiona? Equally courageous. His two kids. And Lord Fiona was preparing the food. Uh, Jared came out with trays of tea in pots and cups and saucers and just the way that they would be if they were serving patrons. Well-mannered and professional, even in that state, was unbelievable. At 19, Jared and Fiona are the youngest of all the hostages. He seemed to trust you. Hmm. Do you know why? No idea. I think it's just because, you know, I served him early in the day. Um, that he, you know, picked me. Why do you think he trusted Fiona and Jared? Their youth, probably. And obviously wasn't expecting them to be quite as smart as they were. I was in that, you know, fix it mode. I was just like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. I don't really have time to register, like, you know, any emotions. But in the darkest of hours, even the bravest have their moments. You went to the bathroom, I understand, at some stage, and you did yes. throw up. Yes, I did throw up. So even though I was trying my best to be really calm, there was so much adrenaline. And I was like, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. And then I threw up. And then I was like, OK, I was not all right. And I washed my face again, dried my face off. I was like, all right, back to work. And we went back down and just started working again, I guess. Back to work. Back to work, yeah. The bathroom becomes a kind of haven for the hostages, where people try to come to grips with what is happening. And I just sat up there and I was thinking, is this real? Like, uh, am I really here right now? Like, or am I just daydreaming, you know, waiting for my, waiting for my break at work and I'm gonna come and open those doors and the, the whole store's just gonna be hustling and bustling with people when it's gonna be 2 p.m. Or am I gonna open that door again and see a crazed gunman with a shotgun pointed in my head saying, why did you take so long? It's a feeling so many have. But the bathroom also becomes a place to make secret calls on a phone Fiona has kept from the gunman. I mean, and Fiona, so that young woman, so stoic, so calm. You know, what a little clever thing she was. Mobile phone in her pocket, my goodness, mm. taking a personal risk like that and sharing that with everyone. She didn't have to share, she didn't have to offer, but she did, you know, um, so amazing, really. I, I offered my phone to everyone who didn't have a phone, but... Um, what they're recognising in you is this generosity to take a little risk yourself, hmm. to offer them something. I, I think, you know, anyone would do that. Harriet, too, has secretly kept her phone and uses the quiet of the bathroom to call her partner, George. What did you say? He asked me if I was in the building, and I said yes. And I said I loved him, as you would, because I didn't think I was coming out. Really? You really didn't think you would come out? You always think that you're not going to come out. And what did George say to you? He said he loves me too, that he's waiting outside. George has raced to the scene from a work site, still dressed in his fluoro shirt, and must now wait, helpless to protect Harriet and their unborn child. 
When did you find out Harriet was pregnant? Uh, uh, she told me um, in one of the bathroom trips. So you found out inside? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a good moment and a bad day. Yeah. That's well put. Yeah. A good moment in a bad day. Yeah. Did it raise your fears for her even more? Yeah, I wanted her out of there. But the next escape will come from an unexpected quarter. Unbeknownst to the gunman, two of the hostages have slipped away from the main group. Ellie and April are under Table 40 hiding. Yes. You see that. Yes. So he couldn't see them. Basically, where everyone else was sitting, they couldn't see them. I remember standing next to Jared and I said, where's April and Ellie? And he looked down and I, looked, I followed where he was looking and they were hiding underneath the booth on that table next to the exit. Ellie and April are now right beside a door that leads into the lobby of the adjoining building. And the door is secured by just one latch. And I saw April was standing up and she was pulling the, the deadbolt down on the side door. Without a sound, Ellie and April open the door and make their run. For the two girls and for the world watching, it is a moment of sheer relief. But for those inside, this new escape holds terrible dangers. Coming up. So I'm reading out the news. The hostages cover their tracks. And so I started just lying. But the gunman turns on the radio. He's realised another two. And he's heard it. We've all heard it. We're gone again. That's next on 60 Minutes.